Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Flop House. I am Dan McCoy. I'm Stuart Wellington. And this is a podcast where we watch a bad movie and then we talk about it. Stuart, what movie did we watch today? Uh, I think we watched a movie called uh, Suicide Squad. <laughs> no, we watched. Uh, is that the one where the guy gets killed by a submarine sandwich? Uh, yeah, yeah, the Invisible Suicide Squad. Is that the one where the guy rips off his ding dong? Yeah, uh, Castle Suicide Squad. <laughs> Hey, everybody, we have a big announcement today. Our good That's friend right. Erich here. Good friend Erich here. I've been trying to, I've been egging him on for a long time, and he's finally going to cave. I've been I saying, Erich. Erich, I, I got all these friends on YouTube. I got Rusty Cage, a guy with like a million subscribers. He makes videos all the time. I got, I got friends like uh, Reactor, 50,000 subscribers, makes videos um, pretty often. But then, Erich. Then I've got some shitty friends, friends like, like me, like Bedhead Bernie and Asperger, <laughs> who uh, never yeah. make a fucking video. It's been months. It's been literally months since oh. either of them have posted a goddamn video. And I'm thinking, what the fuck? I need more friends who actually make videos. E-Rich, could you be my knight in shining E-Rich? And E-Rich said, okay, okay, I, I could, I could I'll probably, I could probably do that. So we're yeah. announcing today that Mr. E. Rich of Is It Kino fame is going to be posting videos on his own YouTube channel, which I have linked in the description. E. Rich, what types of videos are you going to make? Uh, whatever the fuck I want. It's basically like it's it'll basically be the podcast kind of format where it's just a, s a single solid image while I just talk about fucking movies and TV and video games and just fucking anything I want to talk about. Probably not politics because fuck that. Yeah, as it turns out, Everich, he watches a lot of TV shows that I don't watch. Mm -hmm. He sees a lot of movies that I don't care to see. He plays a lot Hell of video yeah. games I don't care to play. So, mm -hmm. you know, this is now his opportunity to review things without a monkey's uncle there <laughs> to hold his hand. So if you if you are interested at all, and I, I hope you are, because my goal Hopefully, is to get yeah. my goal is to get you, Everich, five hundred subscribers in the next two weeks. Let's oh, make it happen, shit. folks. Link oh, in the shit. description. If you want to hear E. Rich review TV shows and games and all that shit, go click that motherfucking link. Click subscribe. Make this happen for me. And, yeah, uh, real podcast hours. Who's up? Real. <laughs> Speaking of real podcast hours, E. Rich, what movie are we talking about today? We saw the Paul Thomas Anderson classic Phantom Thread. Now, how long ago did you see this? Because I know this came out like four months ago at this point. I think I saw it on Saturday. Oh, so recently. I saw this late yeah. last night. I think exactly 24 okay. hours ago. Wow, wow. So it's probably very fresh in your head. Very fresh. A lot of people were posting in the comments the last month. Oh, uh -huh. oh, you guys keep seeing Oscar bait movies. When are you going to see Phantom Thread? And I kept replying, mm -hmm. sorry, we don't review Never. boring yeah. movies on this podcast. <laughs> Um, but I saw it last night, and I will say, mm -hmm. it's not that boring. Wow, I'm I'm surprised. A you glowing pretty... review from Monkey Jones. That that is huge in my mind because you were pretty uh, not willing to go see this movie, and I was just like, I love Paul Thomas Anderson. I'll see anything he makes. Well, let's hear let's hear your initial thoughts on Phantom Thread. All right, so Phantom Thread, I mean, it, it is a pretty long movie. It's two hours and ten minutes long. Uh, and it is about a London dressmaker in the 1950s couture world. And when I heard the description of that, I'm just like, I don't want to fucking see that movie. <laughs> Who gives a shit? The trailer you know was what? probably... I think the trailer for this movie and the trailer for Call Me By Your Name are tied uh, for having the worst possible trailer to make the movie look as boring as possible. I think both you fell asleep trailers, during the trailer. I fell asleep watching the two-minute trailer, yeah. <laughs> it's fucking boring. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, so I love Paul Thomas Anderson, so I, I just realized, well, if this guy is making the movie, then there's got to be something that he's exploring or something that makes it interesting. And then also Daniel Day-Lewis is, is in this movie. Their last collaboration was There Will Be Blood, one of the best movies of the last decade. So, uh, yeah, I was on board. I will say just my initial thoughts on the film. Now, mm -hmm. th this might be controversial. I don't, I don't yeah. think many people share this view. But I would say this film was carried by the performance of Daniel mm. Day-Lewis. Well, um, what did you think about the other, the, the two other women who are the you main know, points you know, in the movie other than DDL? 
I don't respect women, but uh, mm-hmm. but they were fine. But I, I mean, nobody has ever said this before. But I think Daniel Day Lewis is, is a pretty good actor, and I, I look yeah, forward to yeah. seeing what his career brings in the future. I know he has a lot of movies planned to to act in in the future, and I'm I'm mm-hmm. glad this one wasn't his last one. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I think I'm gonna be shit on a little bit for uh, thinking this or he saying rich, this. He rich. You're supposed to you're supposed to make the joke where you say monkey. Are you sitting down? I got to tell you something. What what am I, what am I going to tell you? <laughs> that this is Daniel Day Lewis retired from acting oh, after oh, this film. Oh yeah yeah. No, he's threatened this before. He'll he he, he might come back. Oh, ah, okay. Give, give him two years. He'll okay. miss it. He he'll fucking get into a character for for no movie at all, and then he'll realize that he he can't stop acting. Hey, maybe he'll um, win the Oscar for this movie, and then he'll want to come back and win some more gold. Yeah, who knows? We'll see. And I think we'll be talking about that pretty soon. Um, yeah, so the the name of this character is Reynolds Woodcock. And for some reason, I always get Mr. Daniel Day-Lewis confused with... Uh, Billy Bob uh, Thornton. Billy Bob Thornton. Because he was in a movie <laughs> called Mr. Woodcock. And I was like, what the fuck is going on? And is this some kind of like prequel movie to yeah, that? They're very oh. similar. You know, it's funny that you thought this was a prequel because I thought Phantom Thread was a sequel to The Phantom Menace. And I was very confused ah. the whole time. Didn't make any yeah. sense. And Palpatine is making 1950s <laughs> dresses. Yeah, so uh, the movie centers around this guy who makes dresses, and that, that's basically his entire thing. He's he's kind of, he has this entire house committed to making these dresses. He's got this, like, gaggle of women constantly around him who actually make the dresses because he designs them and makes sure that they all come out perfectly fine. And Paul Thomas Anderson has such a focus on everything he does. He has some very like lovely cinematography in this movie. The music is always by Johnny Greenwood is, is incredible. And it's just, it's a, it's a very intimate look at this world. But I think what I love about this movie is the eventual twist, the eventual kind of thing Uh-oh. that happens, which, which really went bonkers nuts that, that I did not expect something like this to happen. And then I was to, not expecting the film no. about the dressmaker to make me physically feel sick. Like, Oh my God, yeah. what the yeah. fuck? Yeah, and it, it asks some really interesting questions about uh, creativity and w- what you do with that kind of like very specific demon of ha- having this power to wield and be able to enchant people around you, but then using them. Like, I think there's a lot of stuff about like that uh, we saw in Mother in this movie, but uh, uh, I think it's done better in this movie, certainly. Well, but- any movie does anything better than Mother did. <laughs> Yeah, Be- yeah. Before we jump into the spoilers of what made it so uncomfortable, I want to say uh-huh. why this film spoke to me, E. Rich. Okay. I related so much to Daniel Day Lewis's character of Reynolds Woodcock, not just because mm-hmm. I also have a Woodcock, but yeah. because we both suffer from a very similar illness. No, not that, not not Oedipus complex. Not that we both want to fuck our moms like he does in this Electric film. Electric complex. No, that's only for women. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, are, are you trying to tell me you're a man? Uh oh. <laughs> Did you watch my transgender video I posted today? Oh, uh, no, I didn't know. Okay, well, it's probably for the best. Both Mr. Woodcock here and I suffer from a disease that I call um, the artist's. Um, the artist's single minded sociopathy or sociopathy, mm, if you want to be a pretentious yeah. faggot. The idea of. Somebody who is so invested in their art or whatever they're doing that they develop a one-track mind and mm-hmm. accomplishing the the goal of the art in their brain supersedes everything else and they, they become a fucking emotional monster and they're so mean and rude to everybody around them just so mm-hmm. that they can accomplish this goal. And the relationship that Daniel Day-Lewis has with his love interest in the film and the way that he treats her as an object just as the perfect model to wear these dresses that he wants to make because he wants to make the perfect fucking dress because he's Daniel mm-hmm. Day-Lewis and he wants to make this dress. It reminds me a lot of myself when I get into director mode. And anybody who's ever worked with me, you can ask Asperger, you can ask Sheepover, you can ask any of my friends from high school. When I, We can ask Erich, Erich. <laughs> I was going to say, I was in one of your movies. Yeah, we, we were in a 48-hour film festival together, yeah, so you've we seen were. this firsthand, that the, the high pressure of me trying to direct a whole bunch of fucking, a flock of sheeple, uh, mm-hmm. All these, these dumbass actors, and when I'm in that when I'm in that creative zone where I'm just so mm-hmm. one minded focused on getting you know the project what you want. done, yeah, I'm I'm not anybody's friend. I'm an mm-hmm. asshole. I'm mean to you everybody. 
you, you really you, have to be. You do have to be, and it sucks when when you're casting all your friends in your in your films because they don't want to be your friend anymore or be in yeah. your films anymore. But just seeing things that I can relate to on the screen in Daniel Day Lewis's character of him being such an arrogant, rude asshole to the people he's working mm -hmm. with, I was like, you know what? I thought this movie was going to be a, a boring, pretentious slog, but this is actually speaking to me on a on a level I am not comfortable with. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, I I just love in the movie, the the sister, his sister in the movie, mm -hmm. uh, kind of knows exactly how he operates and knows exactly what he needs to do his work. And I mean, like I I think there's some great scenes where her and the love interest sit down and kind of have have a battle of wits or a battle of kind of who's going to win kind of his, his, his attention or his, and it, it, it's just, yeah, it, it, it's true artistry and that can turn into a monstrous person at times. But it, I think a lot of people come up with it's worth it because of the, the thing that they make or the final product. Yeah. But it might not be worth the emo emotional turmoil that the people closest to him have to put up with just to make a, a goddamn dress. Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. And that, that's one but, of the things the that... Dress, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like you can, you know, explore your own thinking as you watch the film. Like, do the ends justify the means in the way he's treating these people? And another thing I wanted to note before we go into spoiler territory, because this movie has yeah. a, a big goddamn spoiler. Mm -hmm. um, I unironically believe that this film has the funniest line of any film in 2017. <laughs> this movie know? is genuinely funny. It's like, very yeah. funny. There yeah. is a... It, number one, the scene is hysterically funny. Number two, it's terribly uncomfortable because it's mm -hmm. like a domestic dispute. But there's a yeah. scene where the girl wants to surprise him with like a, a special Ooh. dinner and she sends everybody home. And he is not having it. No, and he has no. this line of dialogue about how he likes his asparagus to be prepared, and he like mm -hmm. he like is um, boosting his own ego by saying, "Man, I'm I'm such a noble guy for not complaining about this." <laughs> right after he complained about it, and just the wording of the line and the British yeah. delivery were so fucking funny to me. It's got to be. It's funnier than anything that was in Thor Ragnarok. It's funnier mm -hmm. than anything that was in Guardians Two. It was just hysterical and, and and that's what paul thomas anderson does because he has he has such a grasp on what the tone of the movie is and kind of what he wants you to feel in moments if you've ever seen boogie nights have you seen boogie nights no i have and isn't that marky mark yeah it's the marky mark yeah. movie where i gotta he's see a giant it. cock i really yeah. want to see it. It, it it is a fucking great movie where he, he can flip a switch from you're having a good time it's comedy into holy shit like this is serious stuff going on and this movie doesn't have that necessarily but it it can flip emotional switches where yeah when you're watching this uh this dispute between the husband and the wife and he is he is just su such a he, he's basically a child he, he acts like a child in a lot of ways <laughs> but you can kind of see his point of view where he needs his focus he needs his ability to create this art and anybody who comes into his domain and changes things or tries to insert themselves in any way that's not that's not what this thing is for so yeah there are a lot of truly. scenes of them like at the dinner table or the breakfast table where she's just eating too loud for his taste. Mm -hmm. And like he gives these hilarious glares at her like, why are you fucking crunching your toast so goddamn loud, you <laughs> cunt? Mm -hmm. It just like his his angry glares are both funny and frightening because it's like that is not how a husband is supposed to be treating his wife, even in the 1950s. Yeah, yeah. But but also I think the the casting of Daniel Day Lewis in this role is just perfection because he can he can ride that line. He's very soft spoken in this movie. He's not really like shouty a lot of the times, but he does have that menace and that just kind of uh man, it, it's indescribable, but he, he does such a per perfect job. Oh yeah, and it's not like he has a lot of makeup on or anything. He looks like Daniel no. Day-Lewis, but at the same time, he disappears into the role, and I don't mm -hmm. know how he does that. It looks just like the guy, and I don't mm -hmm. recognize him. That's that's a fuck. That's a great performance right there. Yeah, he is truly one of our best living actors. Yeah. Well, it's, not anymore. He, he retired. I don't know if you heard, Erich. You might want to sit down. Yeah, you'll probably have to tell that one more time, and then you get a reaction from me. <laughs> Rule so, uh, you had anything else you want to say before we talk about the the great messed up twist in the film? 
I'd say if it's playing near you and you like Paul Thomas Anderson or you just like Daniel Day Lewis, see this movie. I think that the supporting cast, which is just like the starring page on Wikipedia, is three people. But I think those three people are able to inhabit these characters and this world very, very effectively. And so the Vicky Creeps, I guess her name is, she does such a fucking great job as Alma in this movie. And I think she gives. I think she got Daniel nominated Lewis for an Oscar, right? Gets. I think so. She got um, like no, I mean, a... it might it might be the sister. It might be the sister that Leslie Mann. Oh well, that's too bad. It should have been the uh, <laughs> the main chick. Yeah, let me let me look. I got the list here. Um, yeah, she was not nominated. Oh well, I thought it was her. I guess it was the sister. Yeah, it was the sister. All right, so I guess that's a big recommendation from you. From me, mm-hmm. I would say. Um, I'd say yeah, uh, uh, Redbox this one because mm, mm. because luckily I saw it in an empty theater, so I was allowed wow. to um, get bored in the first half and post a bunch of snarky tweets about <laughs> about shit. But then in, uh-huh. in the second half, once the twist kicks in, it really uh, amps up the movie. But I, the, the first half was a, a tad dull for my liking. Yeah, yeah. I, I think we can get into the twist here, which I'll I'll say that like a lot of movies, the twist can either kill or like vivify a movie, really like show you how great it is. And I think the twist in this movie is like knock you out of the park, like really fully understand who this guy is and how he coexists with other people. It in almost such a great way. for me it changed the the genre of the film. Mm, and mm. It, it really changed the dynamic too. The film starts off; it's like um, it's like a horror movie, yeah. where where Daniel Day Lewis is the monster and this poor woman is the victim. And then halfway mm-hmm. through, it flips around where she's the monster and he's the victim. And then at the end, it's like they're both the monster and the victim yeah. to each other, and they're okay with it. Mm-hmm. It's and, and so I think that's what he was looking for. Like basically, he he found women all the time who were not willing to put up with his bullshit of uh not paying them any attention or not showing them love but what he needs is somebody to like beat him down basically (laughs) and somebody who's strong enough to do that and then build him back up because that that's why he's great that's why he's the person he is is because he does these great things and i I think they're yeah good uh daniel day lewis is pretty much obsessed with his dead mother and there's one scene yeah i I was going to complain that it's a it's a false advertising title because there's no phantom in the film but she does sort of appear as a ghost when he's sick in bed Mm -hmm. and i and i have to imagine that he's just he misses his mother so much and that that you know the caretaker the the affection of a mother and then when when this woman his his um soon-to-be wife (laughs) Should we just spoil it right now? Yeah, yeah. Poisons him. She poisons him with <laughs> with poisonous mushrooms, not mm-hmm. lethal, but to make him very sick. And then like nurses him back to health and takes care of him. I think he he sees a maternal instinct in her to take care of yeah. him and make him better. And I think he has that Oedipus complex where he's now he now actually loves and respects her, unlike before, because now she's sort of taking a motherly approach to caring for him. Mm-hmm. And there's there's a great scene where she's making the omelet for him, and you, you're just wondering the entire time, like, does he know that she is going to poison him? And you just come around to the thought of, oh, yeah, he does. And that just comes up with, oh, shit. So he doesn't mind going through all this shit because he likes the he yeah, likes the being he likes getting and like coming back up. He likes getting deathly ill so that this woman can take <laughs> care of him. And it's so fucked up. Yeah. And then it just ends and you're like, wow, that's weird. What the hell? Yeah. And, and oh that's God. what I'm saying. Where like that part of it makes the entire thing so much better. And yeah. so just interesting to me. Yeah. So great. A very Such interesting a nice character piece. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I, I'll, be, I'll be interested to watch this movie again to really focus on the mother stuff again and to just chart daniel day lewis's performance knowing about that end part and kind of seeing whether that's because i i completely think that daniel day lewis is kind of actor who would take that all in take everything from the script in and then live that as his character so yeah yeah Yeah. well hey so let's uh let's do a quick summary i would say the movie is surprisingly funny has Mm -hmm. some of the funniest lines in the movie it was uh, of the year, I mean, it was surprisingly relevant to me in a in a character sense, and uh, mm-hmm. halfway through it becomes pretty fucked up, and I it piqued my interest quite a bit, and I'd say yeah, Redbox this one and uh, tweet on your phone until it gets interesting. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, 
I would say that I really wish I had seen this before we made our top 10 of the year list because this would definitely have a place on there. What would Probably, you pick out of your top 10? Oh, definitely Mother. Like, I think this explores a lot of the same things as Mother does e. Rich, in a better way. Do you ever think maybe you should kick Star Wars Episode Eight out of your top 10 in favor of a good film? No, I, I've never once thought that, actually. <laughs> Hey, uh, the Oscar nominations came out today. Uh, surprisingly, yeah. Star Wars Episode Eight not nominated for Best Picture. Who would have thought? It was not, but it was edited for Best Score, Best Sound Editing, Best Sound Mixing, Best Visual okay. Effects. Best Score, <laughs> Best Score was not for Star Wars. It was for John Williams because if he makes a score, they're going to nominate him no matter what. He's the Meryl Streep yeah, of music. That's true. No, he's not. He's he's not, not win no, shit. no, fuck you. John Williams has not made a bad score, but uh, what's her face? Has Meryl Streep made a bad performance? Not a bad performance, but she's been nominated outside of her uh, oh, whatever. abilities. Whatever. What's your last word on Phantom Thread? Uh, I loved it. I will probably be seeing it again. Uh, I will probably be revisiting a lot of Paul Thomas Anderson's movies. And I'll probably make you revisit or visit for the first time one of his movies at some point. Yeah, I gotta but, go watch uh, yeah. Boogie Nights. The only other PTA movie I recall seeing, I might have seen, I, I've seen There Will Be Blood, of course. Yeah. But I saw Inherent Vice, and it might be the worst movie I've ever seen in my oh, life. Oh, oh, It's oh. fucking garbage. So I don't, maybe Paul Thomas Anderson's <laughs> a little hit or miss for me. I won't make you see that, but you didn't see The Master? No, but I, is... I, I've i heard so much about that just from going on 4chan's TV board because they talk yeah. about that all the time. That is some great uh, Joaquin Phoenix acting. And it has that there. dead guy from Hunger Games. What's his name? Yeah, Philip Seymour Hoffman. Yeah, Seymour Hoffman. Too bad. Yeah. I got to see Synecdoche, New York, too. Mm -hmm. We won't be seeing any more of Seymour Hoffman. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, speaking of the Oscar nominations... <laughs> Yeah. Next, next Kino episode, we're going to do our big Oscar predictions competition. And um, I'm, I'm switching up the rules for myself. I don't know if Erich is going to follow suit, but I'm going to say, okay. you know, I think last time what we did was we, we made two picks. We picked what we wanted to win and what we thought would mm -hmm. win. But now I say, fuck that. Let's do a competition <laughs> to see who has the most Kino taste. You got to just, mm. you got to pick your favorites for each category and then it will tally yeah. who gets the most predictions correct. And then whoever gets the most points has the confirmed objective, more Kino taste between the two of us. How does that sound? This is bullshit because <laughs> the Academy sucks. Oh, come on. <laughs> the Academy is not the final arbiter for shit. Oh, and um, uh, should we say that we can't have the same pick? Because I say Coco for best animated feature. <laughs> oh, shit. I got to fucking pick Ferdinand. Then. <laughs> well, you God can't pick Lego Batman. No, no we, we, can, uh, we, we can pick the same ones because we're going to write them down beforehand anyway. So we won't even know yeah. what the other guys yeah. is going to pick. But I think we'll have mm -hmm. a few uh, very different answers for some of these, especially if I'm oh, going by my favorites rather than what I think will win. Oh, definitely, definitely. And I, I really try to balance out my selections based on what I think were the best movies of the year and try to apportion what I think deserves kind of from each category. All right. Well, look forward to that coming soon. Go subscribe to Erich. He'll probably Please. review The Leftovers or some shit. Hell yeah, I will. What are you going to review next or first, I guess? Uh, first, I'll probably compare Call Me By Your Name with Phantom Thread because they have some... Uh, uh, easily comparable parts, so I think. Yeah, they're both finish. boring. <laughs> <laughs> you gonna see which one's uh, more boring? Yeah, I'll have a, <laughs> a, a audience applause meter to figure out which one's the most boring. <laughs> All right, for Isakino, I've been Monkey Jones, and I remain e Rich. See. You.